Welcome to this uh, small version, very small version of a beautiful plan we had for winter school. So at the moment we had to postpone it one year. So we hope to see you all back in January 2023. But for the moment you have to do with a short, short introduction lecture in which I'll give you a little bit of flavor of the topics which we want to discuss. So basically the, um, let me see how I continue. So we had a kind and a nice team, three of us from the Arctic Center, and then we had invited a lot of guest lecturers who were uh, experts in different topics. So we could have a lot of discussion and you could learn not only from us, but from more people. But unfortunately, uh, so we couldn't continue. The setup was a little bit that we started with an introductory lecture as I'm doing today, a little bit more on one topic. Now I'm addressing many toppings. Then we would have reading assignments. Then in the afternoon, there would be an introduction of participants and experts and group discussions and uh, sometimes an excursion. So all, all the introductory lectures are based on our educational programs, which we give here for students, uh, bachelor uh, students mainly. So today, I'll give you a small glimpse of our introductory lecture. Uh, but for this course, we had uh, a lot of applicants. In the end, some of them couldn't come, but this is just a map. We were very, very happy with the spread of all the applicants over the world. And uh, we really would have enjoyed to build on the network together with you. Uh, and we hope to do this in future. So, some topics which will pass quickly. Why is the Arctic cold? There are basically three important things to understand this. The first one is that there's not always sun shining. If you look at the globe on the left, because of the tilt of the earth, we have seasons and basically the axis is in such a position that in summer, while the earth rotates, it's constant light in the north. In winter, it's constant dark. So that's uh, the darkness, of course, is a very important thing. But then also the low angle of the sun. If you look at the sun is similar beams, but now in the middle of the equator, it just covers a small area of Earth. But if you look in the same beam in the, in the Arctic, in the top, then you suddenly see that the area which is covered is much bigger. So the intensity of the sun is divided over larger area. And in that sense, the amount of heat presented going to the earth is much lower at a high latitude uh, than at the equator. So you do have day and night, you have constant light in summer, but still there is this variation because the sun turns above your head and it is in a lower angle at midnight than it is at midday in the south. And of course, albedo is an important factor. Albedo is more or less the reflection of the light from a surface. And if the surface is white, a lot is reflected. If the surface is black, then uh, the heat is uh, taken up by the surface. So basically, if you have clouds or snow, then a lot of the heat is reflected into space again. While if you have ocean, then a lot of the heat is absorbed, absorbed by the ocean. The Arctic is getting warmer, much faster than the rest of the world. This is just one typical moment, but basically Arctic amplification, it is called in the climate change studies. The Arctic has been changed a lot and is uh, much warmer, as you will see later. But specifically, the location of Svalbard or Spitsbergen. We in the Netherlands call it Spitsbergen, in Norway they call it Svalbard which is uh, on the left graph, the island in the north uh, top, in the right top corner. Um, that's a place which is warming much more than the environment. Basically also, if you look on the right side, you see that there's a temperature, a mean temperature increase of six degrees already in the last 20 years. And that's of course enormous uh, compared to the rest of the world. 
This is a picture from the uh, ice coverage in December, last December. On this website from, from the National Snow and Ice Data Center, so NSIDC, you can see daily pictures. So I could have uploaded also a picture from two days ago. But this picture already tells a little bit what I wanted to explain to you. If you look at the present ice cover, which is white, or the red line, which is the median ice age over the last, uh, let's say, 30 years, then you see that there's much more open water around Svalbard. And that's the main reason why it's changing so much. Basically, if there is ice, then the warm ocean water is capped by the ice. And so on top of the ice, it's freezing temperatures. If you have no ice, then the heat of the water is constantly um, steaming into the atmosphere, which means that the atmosphere is warming a lot. That's one of the basic uh, things which are happening, but the ice cover has, with the warming, the ice cover has been declining a lot. This is the same moment, December 2021 is relatively uh, a lot of ice this year, but the trend is very clear. It's going down and uh, some people hope that there is no ice in summer in the far future but then we would lose the Arctic as it is. So I'm not that happy with that. This ice is a platform of life. Basically on the bottom of the ice, especially if the ice is multi-year ice, then there's a lot of algae growing. Here you can see that, but it's not only on the bottom of the ice, which is a good position because all the algae are kept in the light phase. There, the light is penetrating through the ice. And while the plankton, the phytoplankton, the plants floating in the water will sink and have difficulty to stay in the light, these plants stay in constant light all the time. But there's a very interesting fact is that within the ice, there are all kinds of channels where a lot of life is living. So basically, I, uh, I wanted to do a small experiment, but if you fill two cups of water and one of them you put in salt and you freeze them, and then when they are still frozen, you turn them around and you drop some cold tea on one of them, on both of them, actually, both of them, then you'll see that the cups where the salt is added, they act as a sponge. There is, while it was freezing, the salt is push, pushed out of the crystalline form of the ice and channels in between the ice get hypersiling and don't freeze anymore. So the sea ice, when it's frozen, is a sponge. And that makes it very interesting for life. So this is, for instance, how it looks. A lot of algae here in the, in the bottom of the sea ice. And if you do this experiment, as is described earlier, then the whole cup will be just turned brown by the coffee. And this is a little bit how it looks. So it's microscopic, it's small, but basically there is a lot of growth because when the sun comes back in the Arctic, everything is still ice covered and it produces a lot, then the ice melts and all these nutrients sink to the bottom of the ocean. That also makes that not only the water column is rich, but especially also the bottom of the, uh, the sea or the ocean is very rich in life because all these nutrients sink to the bottom. Now talking about uh, the difference, I said already earlier, the three graphs in the top, basically if you have snow and ice, a lot of the energy of the sun is reflected. If you have no ice, it penetrates into the water and that makes the ocean warmer. And then especially in winter when there is less ice, the oceans start to emit heat when the sun is gone. But there's also a complication with the clouds. I said earlier, clouds also reflect the light. And so it means that if you have sunlight in summer, then actually a lot of the sun energy is uh, sent back into space by the clouds. While in winter, when there is no light, actually the clouds keep the heat of the earth at the bottom. So this means that the difference in temperature in the Arctic right now is bigger in 
winter than in summer. This is the top graph is a kind of picture of uh, a year some years ago, but it just shows beautifully that the difference in winter that you the black line is the uh, the average the the average values in the past and the blue line is measured in this uh, year 20 uh, i can't see it exactly in my screen but it's much higher much higher temperature while in summer the lines are closer the difference is a little bit less and this difference is actually based on the clouds then there is another phenomena is that it's not only getting warmer in the Arctic, but also the warmer air contains more moisture. And within the winter, there are periods in which for a short time, the um, temperature gets above zero and it starts to rain. The blue bars in the bottom are precipitation with the black lines being the normal. And so you see, you see that the, the rain is exceeded a lot in these periods in the winter when the temperature raises above zero. That's something new. So we have not only a warmer temperature, we have also more clouds and a lot more rain. So for some years, the precipitation was three times what it used to be. Traditionally, the Arctic is a kind of desert amount of rain but uh, now it's getting close to Dutch amounts of rain simply by this change. All of this water in winter freezes immediately when the temperature plunges again. And so what you get is the rain falling on snow turns into ice, a thick layer of icing. Here you see for the village I'm doing my research, how the whole area is filled. Actually, it's an interesting picture about climate change because the fjord is without ice. It hadn't occurred before 2007 and now it's open water since 2007 for most of the winter. While on land there's an ice layer which sometimes even 20 centimeters or more thick. So that's a big difference. What does it mean for the animals? Basically, when you have a rain on snow event, which is the top line and the first and heaviest one was in uh, 1993, then you have a lot of reindeer dying. There was a big population of reindeer still uh, increasing, but you see it fall down from uh, 350 to 50 because there was a lot of icing. And since then it had difficulty to, to recover also because there were other icing incidents. What happened is that if the reindeer die, then the foxes in winter have a lot of food. So the fox population increased a lot. It took two years, but it really was a maximum. And then because there were less reindeer carcasses, actually they did, the fox population died out. And what does it mean for the geese? The geese were uh, doing less with many foxes. And when the fox population died out, they suddenly increased again. So there's an interesting interaction between all these different trophic levels, these herbivore and the predator and then the herbivore again. Complicated interactions, but just a beautiful system to study. So what's happening in the fjord in which I'm doing my studies? Basically also glaciers which come into the, into the fjord are retreating. This is a, just a map of uh, where the glacier was in the beginning of the 20th century on both sides. That's the blue lines and then when it turns to yellow, it's a more recent years. So the, the glacier has retreated for more than two kilometers. And that has happening in all the years. Actually, when I came on in the, in the Kongsfjord in 1990, the glacier was still attached to this island, which is now an island, but which then was called the peninsula, Blomstrand Half Öja. Half Öja means peninsula in Norwegian. And then it turned out to be an island. And every year we can go with a boat to a place where there was a glacier the year before. Just to have an impression on this, on this change, we have pictures from an old period and we have, Greenpeace has renewed these pictures in the same position. 
So this was 2002, where there is already, where it is an island and where the glacier has retreated. But earlier in 1918, the same point looked like this. And if you really look at the tops of the mountain, you can see that it's exactly the same position, but it's a tremendous change and it's still going on. Every summer we are able to sail in an area where the glacier was before. So the big changes, of course, uh, of these glaciers need to be measured. And uh, with this measurement, for instance, for the Greenland ice cap or the Antarctic ice cap, which are more than uh, two kilometers thick, we measured it with satellites is the best measurement at the moment. Just these two satellites fly uh, unattached from each other, but they watch each other via a microwave beam. And as soon as one of them get in another gravity field, then it goes down a little bit while the other one is still on the original position. And only when it's closer, as they are in a distance of 200 kilometers away, then it goes down also. So with these pair of satellites, we have measured the gravity on Earth. And now the interesting thing is that mass is gravity. So if there is an ice cap, there is a lot of gravity. And if the ice melts, there is less gravity. And that can be measured. And so we can have data very nicely on the changes in mass. And here you can see that actually the Greenland ice cap is going down much faster than actually the Antarctic ice cap. But in the Antarctic, we don't understand the process yet. But we're talking about 287 billion metric tons per year. Really nice, important ones. And why is this important? Because if an ice cap melts, the amount of water is enormous. In the Greenland ice cap, there's an amount of fresh water which equals seven meters of sea level rise. While in the Antarctic ice cap, there is an amount of water which equals 63 meters of sea level rise. Really enormous. And so in the old days, we were talking about these seven meters, what the consequences were for the Netherlands, for instance. Now we know that the story is not really happening like that. It's a complication. I hope I can, you can understand it a little bit. <coughs> but basically, the ice cap itself has gravity, and so it, it brings water towards Greenland. So at the moment, the sea level is higher close to Greenland than it would be if there was no ice. So if uh, water melts, then on average over the whole oceans, you get seven meter sea level rise. But in Greenland, it is actually attracting less of the sea of the water. And so close to Greenland, there is a, a reduction of the sea level. And so about uh, 2,500 meters away from kilometers, kilometers away from Greenland, there is a break even point. And so most of the water goes further than 2,500 kilometers. And so the Netherlands is about 3,000 kilometers away from Greenland. So we have minimal effect. While actually on the Southern Ocean, on the coral islands in the, in the Pacific, for instance, they have a tremendous effect of the melting of the Greenland ice cap because all the sea level rise goes in their direction. So we don't have to be as afraid for the melting of Greenland as we were told by Al Gore. But on the other hand, if Antarctica starts to melt, then it will get our way. So we will get a bigger part of this 63 meters of sea level rise than expected. Luckily, at the moment, Antarctica is still quite cold. There is some ice loss, but not to a similar amount. But it's very unpredictable that we don't understand yet the, the release of the ice cap in Antarctica. Of course, what are the consequences for all this, for climate change, for people? A famous example I'm often used is actually that in the village in Spitsbergen, the main town, there was an uh, avalanche in the middle of the dark period. And a whole street with houses was just 
pushed away from their fundaments and moved over a distance of 30 meters. Two people died. It was really a sudden accident. People were living there already since 1920, never had problems with these avalanches, and now it happened. Why? Because there was a lot of rain falling in winter and uh, higher temperatures, which detach the snow from the underground. And uh, that makes the what is normally sticking and ice is then suddenly fluid. And so that makes it move down the mountain. And so uh, very big consequences here in town. And there are other places where there's really a lot happening. Basically in the north of Alaska, there is a town Shishmaref, which where the people now have decided to move. This was just the proper coast, but there were two factors which were important. First of all, the, f the soil was frozen with water in it. So the soil was as a, f as a rock, more or less, with the ice in it. But then when the permafrost thawed then, and disappeared from the soil, suddenly it became sand and it was uh, not that f uh, strong anymore. The other thing is that normally they had ice on the, on, the, on the ocean and the ice disappeared. And so instead of the ice, which kept more or less also the movement of the water and the storms, uh, uh, the storm surges less, now the ice was gone and the, really the big waves hit the coast unprotected. And so the coast, coastal erosion is one of the very big problems where the soil is actually from a sandy origin, especially because the permafrost disappears. And of course, we have these stories about cracking buildings. We have effects on, 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 on roads which are impossible to go through because they are not frozen anymore and they are getting very muddy. There's a story also that there was a, a child in Russia uh, which died of anthrax, which is a bacteria which is deadly, uh, which uh, came out of the permafrost again. And so that's also uh, even other viruses might come from the from the frozen soil and threaten the people. And this is a picture of cultural heritage. These are whaler graves from the 17th century. So Dutch whalers who died during the, their whaling period, they were buried on graves on, on Spitsbergen. And here the same effect is that the waves are just eating into the grave field. And so the coffins start to disappear or fall in the ocean while they have been there since the 17th century. The Arctic Center became famous because uh, some of these graves were excavated and actually we found a lot of cloves which were very well preserved in the soil. Uh, so this is one of the few places on earth where they could, where uh, archaeologists could study the workman clothes from the early 17th century, which was very typically Dutch actually. So they were not wearing skin, animal skins or something like that, like Inuit would do, but they just have their woolen hats and their uh, other stuff. An interesting example also of the unexpected things happening with climate change is not only these avalanches or this coastal erosion, but on Svalbard they made the Global Seed Vault, a place in the mountain where the seeds of the world are stored. If there is anywhere a big disaster, then uh, still the seeds are there for crops which have been improved over ages uh, and they are still available to feed the remaining people. So they built the entrance of this, for instance, 70 meters above sea level, just to make sure that if all of Antarctica and all of Greenland would melt, which is a prediction for 2400 at the earliest, but then still it would be above sea level. And the mountain is frozen by itself. So if there would be no electricity, then basically the mountain would stay frozen for another 10,000 years. So they built this and started to stock it with seeds. And four years later, 
in such a rain event in winter, the water was just running down the corridor. And so instead of having the corridor built upwards, they built it downwards. So the water was freezing the entire corridor and they had to spend millions to get it up to shape again, because you can't remove the ice by just warming it a little bit, because the whole principle is that the mountain should be frozen. But this is just an example. You built something for eternity and just four years later, there is an unexpected uh, climate change event and then it doesn't work. Another example with my own house on Svalbard, these huts, they were just sinking in the permafrost. So they, in 2013, they uh, lifted them, they placed them on another place. This is not the place where the houses were. And then they rebuilt the fundaments again. And so uh, two years ago, already some of the new fundaments were floating again, simply also the permafrost, the ice disappearing out of the soil. And so the new tradition is that all the houses have to be funded on the bedrock. So they are drilling deep holes to fund it on the bedrock below. In the early days in those Arctic towns, the uh, pipes were on top of the, of the permafrost so they could repair them in winter. These are heated pipes in these uh, wooden houses. And they, uh, they just, if there is a problem, if something freezes, you can uh, repair it. But then they found out that also uh, with a special flexible type of, of, of pipe, they could place it in the, in the soil. So most of these uh, upper pipes are removed now but still you see how difficult it is to remain them. But also here, what you see is an effect of permafrost disappearance and simply the, the, they, they fall down. They, these ones have really fallen down. So they put the pipes in the ground. And so when I came there last year, a place where they had put also more snow looked like this. And this is exactly a site where the heated pipe is going from where the picture is taken to the other side. And so this shows how much heat is actually released from the bottom to the top, melting in this case, the snow, but also in summer, it means that outside the pipes, you have melted permafrost. And so you have all kinds of waterways, rivers, which weren't there. And then the problem is that all of these pipes, they go in one corner into the houses. So these melting permafrost is going on one side. And so many of the houses actually are springs of water where the water comes up of the, these rivers. On the biology, there's also a lot happening. So at the moment, we, uh, we were able to catch mackerel on Spitsbergen, which is actually in the 1900s, mackerel was closer to the Netherlands. And over the years, it has moved a little bit upwards along the Norwegian coast, but now it even reached Spitsbergen. And there have been other fishes like the snake pipe fish or the capelin, which were just star part of new species caught on Svalbard. My own data, just a little glimpse on my own data. For all the years I've been going there since 1990, I'm checking when the, when the young are born and so that determines the timing of the breeding season for the geese. This is just a part of the graph which I've collected so far, but basically there was little change for more than 10 years. So from 1993 to 2003, the, there was no change while it was getting warmer. But then there was a sudden change and then the geese came earlier and they came exactly earlier um, one week earlier and they stayed on this level and with this shift they have followed the shift of snow free tundra which happened. It's an interesting shift because if my research would only have been for four years my conclusion would be that the geese don't adapt to another temperature. If it would have been 10 years I wouldn't have said that the, that, that the, that the geese would adapt. But now with having it 20 years, suddenly you can see that the geese do adapt to the warming temperature. So that's also a claim for um, doing more on uh, long-term monitoring. 
So another example of this long-term monitoring is for, from my colleague, Jauke Prop, who already started in 1979 on another place on Spitsbergen, where you see the red dot. And so there were hardly any polar bears in the area. I was there in 1986 and we didn't have a gun. We were just, there were no polar bears. But so in 2002, it started to change. And at the moment he has different polar bears visiting his environment every three days, a different polar bear. So really a big change. That's partly related to climate change because of course the ice is going away, but even more of that, and this is what they do actually, they visit this place. He was studying the geese, but the polar bears are now eating the nests, the eggs of the, of, of the geese. Uh, they have easy access to the, um, to the islands. And so when we came there in uh, 1979, our first impression was there's enough breeding space, space for the geese because there were lots of islands where they could breed. Before that, they were breeding on the bird cliffs, high up, free from predators, but they moved to the islands. The polar bears weren't there and the islands were safe because the foxes didn't swim to the islands. Now we know that 100 years ago, there were many polar bears who also could swim to the islands and would have eaten the eggs. So the only place to breed was on the bird cliffs and there's less space on the bird cliffs. So the population was actually quite smaller. There were only 260 geese in the uh, 1943 in this population. And now there are 40,000 quickly decreasing, not only because of the predation by the polar bears, but last winter, the estimates right now are that the, a quarter of the population died from avian influenza. A big change also, and a new effect, which on the other hand is interesting to study. But polar bears are getting more common and it's getting also more dangerous. Last summer, we had 29 encounters within town with polar bears. Is this climate change? No, it's more complicated because what they actually did was they were hunted very excessive until 1972. They were even, they were placing these, these uh, cabinets on the coast where there was a gun with uh, a piece of seal in front of the gun. And when the polar bear would take this, it would shot itself through the head. So all the polar bears, which were not afraid of people, were shot. And the remaining ones were afraid of people and stayed away. But now since 1972, now the population is not hunted and slowly the numbers are increasing. In my town, even linearly going up, simply because they are not afraid anymore for people. The young bears come with their mother and they learn that they are maybe chased away, but there's not really something happening. Okay, that was a little bit about climate change, but still the winters are cold. And just I want to show you a little bit on the adaptation of the animals which are in the Arctic. This is reindeer, which are there in winter, and they really have a thick pelt, a thick fur to survive the winter. Here you see the two types of fur, the summer fur with a lot of hairs, long hairs, and the, wind, uh, the winter fur has the long hairs on top, and the summer fur is much smaller just because in winter they need to be isolated but if they would have wearing this coat in summer then they would get overheated when they start in winter they have a lot of fat and they live from the fat sometimes they just uh, don't move anymore and they just use the fat to grow in the end of summer they have used all the fat but they are still insulated by the long hair this is how it looks basically, but this is how a reindeer looks in spring. This was a, li a live reindeer, but you see all the fat has disappeared, but it's still kept warm by the warm fur, which is very specialized. All the hairs have a lot of chambers in them, which uh, keep air still and which uh, give a good insulation power. Also in the, there are adaptations in the animal with the blood flow. Basically, for instance, in the leg and in the mouth, in the nose, there is the blood flow, the, 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 the flow going to the outside is warming the blood flow, which is going inside. This is a counter current principle. And 
uh, in, tech, in technical terms, this is the most efficient exchange of heat. So it does mean that without losing a lot of heat, actually the body temperature stays high, but on the outside, uh, it can be quite cold, close to freezing, and it, the, the animal is not affected by it. Another interesting adaptation is the antlers of the reindeer. Reindeer are the only species of deer which, where the females have antlers. And these antlers are important in summer because they make it possible for the animal to fatten up without getting overheated. While the antlers are growing, there's a skin around the antlers which deposit the calcium. And uh, the blood flow through the antlers is a kind of cooling device. As soon as the antlers are fully grown and the reindeer is fat and it's getting colder, then the skin is removed and the antlers are not exchanging any heat anymore with the environment. And so the reindeer doesn't lose any heat via the antlers anymore and is prepared for winter. A beautiful adaptation, which you can see a little bit on these thermal pictures. We took a picture of a reindeer, which is calmly grazing. You see how well the body is insulated already. There's a little bit of the antlers and the nose and the eyes visible. And then we ran after the reindeer for some time. And suddenly you see that much more of the antlers are emitting hate. It's just the reindeer is getting warm because it's running and it emits heat, not with the body, but with the head and the antlers and the legs. Being warm, you can behave differently. This is just the polar bear in different postures. And uh, you can see the uh, on the right top, you can see when it's cold, they make a, a ball out of them. When it's warm, this is a picture from Canada on the Hudson Bay. They just lay there to lose their heat. That's their mechanism. Or they go and lay on snow or they go and swim. That's their mechanism to cool. The fur of the, of the polar bear is very interesting because it is adapted to lose water very fast. This is just a, a picture of a polar bear coming out of the water and you see how the water really splashes out of the fur. Another adaptation. So it's still warm because of the long hairs, but the hairs are a little bit lower quality, but it's really a good fur to lose water, to become dry again when you come out of the water. That adaptation is used also by Inuit. Their trousers traditionally are made of polar bear skin. They have boots from seals with the sole of a bigger seal, the bearded seal. Uh, they have uh, trousers from polar bear because if the trousers get wet, they can quickly dry. And the body is reindeer because that's just big amounts of fur and it is also very warm. And then on the, on the mittens and on the face, it has wolf or dog, because if, you're, uh, if you get wet over there, you can just shake it off. Adaptations. So these local people, they have been adapted to the Arctic. This is a picture of uh, Russian uh, uh, reindeer herders, which actually face a lot of changes. What's the traditional way of life and how can they do their identity? But also who has the right to their land? Those are big issues which are very uh, complicated. How do you uh, keep right to all the prey? <coughs> and how does the Western world react on your hunting? As for instance, in the European Union, we can't import any seal skin or something like that while the Inuit, for the Inuit, it's their way of life to hunt for the seals or to do fisheries. So if we look at the population in the, uh, in the Arctic, there are 4 million people living in the Arctic and about 10% of them are indigenous. But the difference in the, in the locations where they live is very big. If you look at Greenland has the highest indigenous population, Canada, it's also more than half but all the other places, and especially Russia, has very little indigenous people still living in the Russian north. That's, uh, they have limited uh, rights over there, but also because of the Gulag, which were Russians prisoners were sent by Stalin to the Russian north. It's just invaded by Russian people who now live there. 
and have their lives over there too. So it's just typical where these indigenous people live. The story about the Arctic and what to do with the Arctic actually accelerated because as soon as people started to realize that the ice was disappearing, they talked about oil and gas reserves. So several sites also at the moment, there's at the moment gas production or oil production. There's a lot of industry in the Arctic and uh, the predictions are that there's still a lot of oil and gas. The other thing is that travel to the uh, to, to Japan and China might be shorter when they go through the north. So they saw all kinds of economic possibilities to start and even Russia started to develop the Arctic North because at the moment the northern route is not handy because there's no possibility to trade along the route and it's just covering a large distance with still unpredictable ice situation. But so Russia has made a nuclear power station on the boat and which they can place at a, at a certain coast and then they have lots of electricity there and they can develop a harbor. So who's owning the Arctic and what's happening when the ice is gone? So in 2007, Russia played a, placed a flag on the North Pole and claimed actually the area of the North Pole until the North Pole itself. The basis of all this claiming at the moment is the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. It's a, a law which divides the region off the coast into different categories and basically up to 200 nautical miles, that is 1852 meters, countries have the exclusive right to use the bottom resources in that area. But there's an interesting extension uh, that is that if you have an area towards the continental shelf, then that, uh, this area of the continental shelf is you have still access to the bottom resources. So your fisheries, it's already international, but bottom resources can be developed by the country linked to that period. While the 200 mile zone is really more or less defined, continental shelf border is not defined. And you see a lot of discussion now on what the continental shelf is. And the other thing is even there's a discussion on the internal waters, because basically the UNCLOS also says that there is a right of passage through sea straits. And uh, America says that the Northwest North, uh, Passage through Canada is a sea strait. Well, it was never open, but now it becomes open and they say it's a sea strait linking the Atlantic with the Pacific, while the Canadians say, no, it is an uh, internal waters. So it's very complicated now to solve the situation. So this is the claim of the Russian country. And this is the claim of the Denmark, which is quite interesting, which goes beyond the North Pole even to the uh, almost to the border of the uh, Russian uh, 200 mile zone. Uh, it is, uh, they, they, this, this claim is following the Lomonosov Ridge and they state that this is part of the continental shelf from both sides, but actually it's a mountain ridge which is 1000 meters underwater. While the basins are 3000 meters deep, this one is still 1000 meters deep. So nobody would have thought it, you could call it um, the continental shelf, but internationally there is a lot of debate now and people try to define the area. So with the changes in the Arctic, there's also more military activity. This is east of Svalbard, you have Franz Josef Land, which is even much more colder than Svalbard. And there's a nice new base, military base built there with an airport and things like that. So there are military there constantly. And while we have now the focus on the Ukraine, also in, uh, in, in, in uh, the Arctic, there's still tension going on. Basically in 2017, there were a lot of things happening in a short time with uh, saying that an, a NATO meeting on uh, Svalbard was a provocation that Russian forces, they did an exercise within, within the zones of Russia, but they played as if they were attacking uh, Spitsbergen. 
and then Russia made a list of, of uh, the areas where they uh, say there's a risk of war. Ukraine was one of them, but also Svalbard was named as one of them. So certainly it's still uh, uh, some military tension. Uh, this is, uh, for instance, news from 18 February 2021 where Russia was firing a, muscle, uh, a missile in the international waters north of Svalbard. And the Dutch military is in northern Norway, still training and uh, making sure that if something happens, that they will fight there in their NATO commitment. What will happen in the future is unclear. Uh, so far, of course, the, especially America has invested a lot in nuclear submarines, which were very difficult to detect under the ice and could stay there for a long time. If the ice disappears, they are much easier to dis detect. So the whole strategy, also international strategy, need to be rethought. I personally don't think that oil or shipping will be the fast arguments to change the decision on who owns the center of the Arctic Ocean. But what I do think is that safety might be an argument. If the waters get ice free, then of course it becomes important that if there is an accident, who will respond? Who will take responsibility? So my personal view on this is that the uh, Arctic Ocean will first be divided into zones for safety and rescue, and then maybe later also for economic use. To show that there are good steps, it's actually here you see a debated area between Russia and Norway, which was debated for very long. And uh, it was an interesting area because on both sides there is gas and oil. And so they, uh, they were just solving this in 2004 uh, as the UNCLOS wants them to solve it and they just uh, cut the area in half. And so now both countries have access to the bottom resources in this area. So they were both very happy with this, but it took a long time to solve this. Also, the Spitsbergen Treaty is unique because basically it makes access for people and companies from other uh, countries. It is clearly there is a process of uh, Norwegianization. Norway wants to, to change this slowly a little bit, but basically it is uh, still a kind of European Arctic. But there is a debate also on this one, which is happening right now even. There was uh, the, the Norwegians say that the, 200, when the Svalbard Treaty was built, then only there was the territorial waters of eight kilometers around the island. And now it's 200 nautical miles. And the Norwegians say, yeah, but that's not in the treaty. That is from Norway. And so even the High Court decided with as topic, not oil or gas, but as these crabs which live on the bottom, that the 200 miles all is exclusively for Norway. And that's just a debate. Uh, so the EU actually got, gave permits for fishermen to go there. And the Norwegians said, we will, we will bring them up and try, bring them to trial if they do that in Norway. So none of them, none of the fisheries were caught. And at the moment, there's a debate with uh, the UK leaving, um, leaving the European Union and the European Union still wanting equal amounts of fisheries in the area. So all this is still going on and uh, it is uh, not solved yet. Uh, there is a good cooperation between the different countries, which is called the Arctic Council, which has member states, the, the eight Arctic countries, of which five are coastal to the Arctic Ocean. They have the indigenous people in a role. I think that was needed to make the Arctic Council a different body than the United Nations. They also have decided never talk about military issues, but talk about cooperation and, and nature conservation. And then they have observers, which can be organizations like the World Wildlife Fund or states. And the Netherlands is also an observer into this. So with this picture, I just, uh, and my presentation, I just jumped a little bit from all the different uh, 
topics which we normally would cover in the week, but also showing a little bit how wide our aim was to 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 spend topics on in this um, in this winter school. And I hope that this lecture helps you to be motivated to be also enlist for this course next um, next January when we will have it and when I hope that the COVID epidemics is more under control. So we stop recording now and uh, if you have questions,